Good day, everyone. Welcome back to the Helix Center. I'm Gerald Horowitz. I'm the Associate Director of Helix. And we're here with a wonderful panel today on the many minds of memory. We're going to allow Beverly Zabriskie to give you more detail about our wonderful panel. Uh, before that, I want to mention a few, uh, make a few comments. First of all, I hope everyone is holding on and doing well through this pandemic. It's been a very long haul. Everyone's had to uh, adapt to it, including uh, us here at the Helix Center, including these Zoom roundtables. But we do what we can, right? And we're getting through this. Um, I want to mention that we have a few uh, additional roundtables coming up. We're anticipating on February 20th, we're going to have a talk on populism. And then sometime in March, date to be determined, uh, a talk on placebo, nocebo response. There may be yet an additional one on stress later into the spring. So that's it for now. I'll hand it over to Beverly Zabriskie. Welcome. Um, I was just saying that this is our second Zoom Helix program. We're not sitting in a circle with each other. We're not bouncing off each other's chemistry in the same way at all but we have a particularly wonderful, lively, creative, and deep group of presenters today for whom I'm very grateful that they were able to change the date from last March 14th, which was the cusp of COVID to today. So I wanna express my appreciation to all of you. We have physicians, neurologists, an artist, dog cognition researcher, author. And if you, after the program, look at their biographies, you will see an extraordinarily varied and deep um, list of accomplishments so that we don't take up the whole program talking about them rather than hearing from them. I've asked each of them to go around and tell us, just say what, what your um, profession is, and maybe your title and what you most want to be remembered for professionally. And then for all the credentials, we can each research that on our own. So can we start with uh, Christina Alberini? Sure. Hi, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, everyone at the Helix Center for organizing this, this e-meetings, they are very important so that we can keep being connected. Uh, and second, let me tell you what I'm doing. I am a professor of neuroscience at the Center for Neuroscience, New York University. And I have been studying for now about 30 years, the biological basis of learning and memory. And of course, if we want to get into biology, we have to use models. We are not using humans. Uh, because we need to get into the brains of uh, models and understand what type of biological mechanisms change with learning and which ones are important for making memories. And of course, memories come in different types. We'll, I'm sure we'll discuss about that. Uh, so the questions we have in the lab is mostly about memory formation and storage. Uh, and also about how memories are retrieved. So when we recall memories, what happens to the biology of the brain and what are the biological mechanisms that come into play to change those memories? Because at every single recall, we change our memories and, uh, and, the, and the storage of information. Uh, and uh, what do I want to be remembered for in my, for my professional contribution? Well, I hope there is many more things to come, so I'm looking into the future. Uh, but ideally, of course, is not only to um, progress uh, uh, significantly in the understanding of the biology of memory, which is what we do, but also to find mechanisms through these studies that are important for memory losses and uh, diseases of memories. And those are many. Uh, I can just mention a few. Of course, Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative diseases that come with memory loss, but also cognitive impairments in neurodevelopmental disorders, as well as problems of memories due to traumatic experiences. 
or addiction. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. You're on mute, Beverly. We can't hear you. Richard, author, distinguished author. Well, um, hello, everybody, um, and thanks to the Helix organization. Um, I'm not a dog recognition expert, um, although the first half of my career, maybe I was, in that I was a publisher and editor and recognizing the dogs and the successes as part <laughs> of my job. Um, more recently, although I continued editing, when I came to the States, my first freelance job was to edit the autobiography by Rudy Giuliani, but I normally like to keep quiet about that. Um, I've written um, four published books since coming to the States. Um, uh, I've also contributed to a book more recently, The Presence of the Past, Essays on Memory um, for the Academica Press. Um, in terms of what I'd be most uh, pleased to be remembered for, I suppose it's a book that I've got coming out in June, which is called The History Makers, which looks at people who have influenced our, our ideas, shaped our ideas of the past, from Herodotus to the TV age. Um, so um, I'm very much here with the hat of a historian, um, um, but with a particular interest in how memory works, which, of course, has had a large part to play in the writing and history. Thank you very much, Richard. And then the neurologist, um, Gayatri Devi, who is also the author of Spectrums of Hope about the aging brain. Gayatri? Thanks for having me, Beverly. Um, I'm a neurologist. I'm director of Park Avenue Neurology, and I'm a clinical professor of neurology at Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. I've been a cognitive neurologist for 26 years now. I can't believe it's been that long. And um, love my job. And what I'd like to be remembered for is two things. One, that Alzheimer's disease is a spectrum disorder and it is informed very much by the brain that the person brings to the illness. Your strengths and weaknesses inform how you develop it, how you manifest it, and how you respond to treatment. So it's very different, for example, from kidney disease, where you can, the same kidney condition um, means the same thing in multiple people, whereas Alzheimer's in one person is a private Alzheimer's and very different from Alzheimer's in another person. And the same thing with mild cognitive impairment or memory problems that they vary and are very, very private to each person's brain. Um, and the second thing I'd like to be remembered for is um, the systematizing of menopause-related cognitive loss. Women going through menopause have cognitive loss, which can mimic that of early Alzheimer's and when it's not recognized and treated as such, and unfortunately, in neurology, we don't actually get a menopausal or um, a history of um, anything related to the uterus from women as a rule. Um, that systematization, um, I'm, I'm very proud of. We just published that in um, the Journal of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So thank you very much for having me. And thank you for being here. And Andy Lee, who is a neuroscientist at the University of Toronto, it has been working on memory disorders for many years. Andy? Hey everyone. Um, thank you for uh, the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's a real privilege to be here and to be a part of this panel. Um, so as Beverly just said, I'm based uh, in Toronto at the University of uh, Toronto, um, out at the Scarborough campus. And I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, so my lab uh, is interested in how a group of structures in the brain, probably the most familiar one to a lot of people is the hippocampus, how that's involved in memory processing. So we do a lot of brain imaging, MRI scanning. We uh, look at patients with amnesia. And our particular interests are how memory interacts with other things. So uh, perception being one, decision making. Um, and if there is uh, one thing maybe I would like to be remembered by, I think, um, I think that was Beverly asked this earlier, and I was thinking, what do I want to be remembered by? And I wasn't quite sure. But 
I think maybe I'm maybe I'm not ambitious enough, but if in 10, 20 years, uh, at least one thing that we've discovered um, is, is has actually contributed to our understanding of how the brain actually processes like time in memory or, or visual items in memory and gives us a little bit of understanding in, into why patients like Alzheimer's disease patients have memory problems, um, I'd, I'd be happy. So so that, that's my, my, my answer to that question. That is quite ambitious, Andy. And we have an author and a researcher and professor at Barnard College at the Dog Cognition Lab. And I think her last book has really marked this particular era as far as I see from the people that I'm in contact with, which is Our Dogs Ourselves, A Story of a Singular Bond. Alexandra, thank you for being here. Thanks, Beverly, and thank you to the Helix Center. I'm pleased to be with you all here. Um, as Beverly said, you know, I'm a teacher at Barnard College, and I'm a senior research fellow there, and I head the Dog Cognition Lab. So I'm a cognitive scientist studying non-human animal mind, and the dog is the, my non-human of interest. Mm -hmm. um, and I've written a, widely on, on dog mind and the dog-human bond. Um, I think... I'd like to be remembered for bringing our attention back to um, imagining the umwelt, the worldview, the perspective of non-human others, I think. Um, and I don't know if I have fully imagined the worldview of others, but maybe um, by the end of my life, that can be an accomplishment I look back on. For now, it's just bringing people's attention to the perspectives of others and remembering that there is a perspective that is different from the human perspective. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And it reminds me that um, in, at the temple, the healing temple of Asclepius, if a person had a dream, a patient who went there and had a dream of a dog, it was considered a very positive prognosis. So I, I sort of work out of that template myself these days. And um, then we have a lady that I met at the last Chinese Lunar New Year, Sesto Winchester, who is an artist, an activist artist, a journalist, a broadcaster, and she will tell you um, some of the projects that she has created. Uh, thank you, Beverly, and the Helix Center for um, hosting this discussion. Um, I think uh, this discussion sort of came out of the talk that we had at that dinner where we were talking about if history is the collective memory of a nation, then what happens if you're consistently missing from that story or you're constantly vilified in it? So, um, you know, what happens to your present and how does it affect your future? So I, for the, I used to be at NPR, which deals with the history of the moment. But I think my husband writes history and looks at history at a longer <laughs> range. And I think that perspective is important. And uh, uh, because I'm married to him, I've been given the opportunity to look at a slice of history through a perspective and a lens that is often not not shared, and that's the Japanese American or Asian American history. And uh, if you look at that, America can look very, very different, and so can freedom, the idea of freedoms. So my project that I would like to be remembered for is, uh, it's called Freedom from Fear Yellow Bowl Project. I'm a conceptual artist, although I use ceramics. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about history and about um, identity, time, memory. So um, it's a, uh, I took 120 yellow tea bowls that I hand pinched and I took them to all 10 U.S. concentration camps um, uh, that was in the United States in the 1940s and I photographed them. And uh, because of that, they've sort of been invited to different places. Um, I have to say not many people like this story and there's been a pushback on it, but I really thank this panel for giving me a platform. Thank you. I get it. 
So, Richard, you agreed to start the discussion itself? Yes, I drew the short straw because everybody else was keeping sensibly quiet. Um, I think I'd just begin as, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, or um, any of those disciplines, with having read recently Paul Ricoeur's book, uh, Memory, History, Forgetting. And in that book, he has 79 in his index um, and contents pages together, 79 different categories under memory. So where on earth does one start? And I thought that to start the ball rolling, I would refer to Sigmund Freud, um, who saw memory as constantly transforming, reorganizing, um, revising. And that, even in our introductory comments that people have made, um, was acknowledged. But I want to start by asking the other members of the panel the other point that Freud makes. And he says that memory is essentially creative. What do people think he meant by that? And how does that tie in with your own studies? I think I can start. Um, yes, so to get to these questions, let's remind ourselves <clears throat> and who is listening to us that memories come in different flavors. As you mentioned, they gave 79 categories of memories. And of course, there are different ways to categorize them. Uh, one or two major ways that in neuroscience we use to categorize memories is according to their duration, long-term mem long memories, short-term memories. Short-term memories, they last for a very short time. Long-term memories, they last for a long time. That's very easy to remember. <laughs> Uh, and why are they different? They are different because the mechanisms that the brain used to make and express these memories are different. Uh, and, uh, and another way to categorize them is according to what they do. There are different memory systems and different types of memories. We have declarative, explicit memories, or we have uh, in contrast to this, implicit type of memories. Uh, for example, the explicit declarative memories are the memories we talk about. So we, if we are here today and we talk about what we have learned, those are declarative memories. And in the same system, also memories of general knowledge. Uh, if, if, if I say city, you all know what I mean by that concept. Uh, so those are part of one memory system, which is processed by the medial temporal lobe that has been demonstrated uh, by many, many studies in humans as well as in non-human animals. If uh, part of this memory system is impaired or, or, or their activity, the activity is blocked, those memories do not form. Those long-term memories do not form. Um, as opposed to other uh, uh, major system of memory, the implicit type of memories, the memories of how to do things is not, they are not spoken, they are performed. For example, if we go skiing, we have to learn how to ski and then we remember. Those are very, very strong memories. Uh, memories of how to drive a car, ride a bike, tie your shoes. Everything we do that we learn and memorize, which become sort of automatic, those are the part of the implicit memory systems. And but of isn't course, that talking about muscle memory? Muscle memory is performance. So the performance include the muscle memories. And those are part of the implicit memory system because we perform those memories. We execute them in an implicit way. We don't think about. After we have learned, we don't think about how to turn the wheel when we drive a car, right? We just do it automatically. And in the same implicit memory system, we have also emotional memories, memories that, uh, that are expressed without a conscious awareness. So the other distinction is conscious awareness versus not. Implicit types of memories are not conscious in their expression, and explicit type are. So there are many different types of memory. Now, I don't want to go on and on because it's a long story, but um, so... Is it a creative process like Freud suggested? So first of all, I have to say that Freud 
was brilliant in, in predicting, uh, let's say, in his writing, so many, many aspects and, and processes that we then in neuroscience discovered in the memory, in the memory domain. Is it a creative process? I think, I, 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 yes, I do agree. And why? Because when we form memories and they are stored, uh, if we need to retrieve them, because there are recollections, something that reminds us of whatever happened in our history, in that precise moment, we are living a different experience at a different time. So now the new experience in the present is going to be associated somewhat to whatever is recalled and is going to be restored in, a, in, a, in, in another context. So that is already a, a processing of the memories, which happens, as you can imagine, every moment, every day. But also, we re-elaborate memories. So if we think about something and we recall experiences, uh, and, and we start thinking about something else because of an emotional, for example, an emotional uh, experience that is so important to us, we start creating associations, new associations, which will become new memories. And so the creative process is about who we are, made of the multitude of experiences through learning, memorization, recollections, and re-elaboration. I hope that gives some, some um, topic for discussion. I might <clears throat> complement that by answering Richard, your question in a slightly different way. I mean, I hear when I think of whether memory is a creative process to which I also assent, I think that my interpretation is to say that um, memories are not necessarily veridical. In other words, they're not necessarily representative of the world that's out there because they are interpreted through the subjective self. And it really puts to the point whether if we could view everyone's memories, other humans or non-humans, whether we would recognize them. In other words, whether they are even understandable or kind of interpretable or translatable by others, right? And so I, I, to me, that's a very generative way to begin this conversation and thinking, as Christina said, not only about the re-encoding and the changing of memory that happens with, mem with remembering, but also about the very creativity of memory to begin with, that it is an interpretation of a moment or a scene or a fact or an experience um, and says something is incorporated with the self, which might be impossibly subjective. I agree with you, Alexandra and Christina as well. I think um, all memory is a fabrication of our brain. Every single memory we have, reality is really, truly a fabrication of our brains. Um, and it's an individual reality, which is not necessarily parallel to the reality of someone right next to you, because it's always filtered through your experience, uh, through your neural networks, um, through your interpretations, um, and through your editing of what you see. Um, so not only are you going to have alteration and distortion of memory as you recall, but you also have um, a true editing and distilling of memory as you lay it down. So there's a tremendous amount of editing that goes on in both the laying down of memory, what you choose to attend to, um, how you choose to store it, what you choose to link it to, whether or not it's real. Again, all reality is a fabrication of our individual brains. Um, and then how you choose to reproduce it, which is always going to be different from one person to the next. Even if you agree on the generalities, the details are going to be different because each of us chooses to remember um, something different. So. Freud um, was absolutely correct in terms of how he formulated memory. Cecilia. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Let's go. Yes. Let's go. Um, 
I, I have to say that I think there's a difference between personal memory and collective, you know, national memory, like history. And um, I think one of the battles that we're having in America right now is for the story and the history of America. And basically, there is a narrative that starts with Columbus and there's George Washington and, uh, you know, Adams and, uh, um, you know, Jefferson. And then it goes to Lincoln and then FDR. And then we're at today. And um, in that story, uh, the history of the original people that were here is missing. For example, um, there were there was a survey um, about five years ago. I think they uh, found out that forty percent of Americans believe that no Native Americans are alive today and that they are extinct, like dinosaurs. And, you know, if you read our newspapers and our, and our history books, you sort of believe that um, they're actually very much alive. A lot of them have, were put on reservations. They've moved into cities to survive, and they're still there. And the other story that never gets out, it's usually uh, race is a big issue today. And um, the reason why race is often only seen in a white and black dichotomy is because the whole history of non-white laws is never talked about in our history books. And the not white laws were all determined in our court of law, and they came out after the Civil War. So it was determined in 1870, which was an update of the original naturalization law of 1790, which said that only white people can become a citizen, um, was changed in 1870 to include Africans and persons of African descent. So after that, there's there's been law after law after law, which people who were not African <laughs> but who were deemed not white, had to go to court because they were excluded from citizenship, from practicing law, from marrying other people, um, from, uh, you know, they couldn't even testify against white people. Chinese could not testify against white people. And then all Asian people were banned from the United States in 1924, which was actually the first year that Native Americans were allowed to naturalize. So there's this whole history that's, missing. So, I mean, is that a creative process? Maybe it is. <laughs> creative doesn't know. always mean good, right? Yeah, right. We tend to think creative means good, but it doesn't have yeah, to be. It can be yeah. creative in an evil way, right? It's and almost your thoughts? To me, it's almost like a what Setsuko was saying. It's almost a, a destructive, it's a destructive process. Um, in that we can create memories, but we can also, um, I mean, one of the, the big questions that people ask is, can we actually re remove memories? Um, so unpleasant memories, can we remove them for our own, own benefit? Um, and, and unfortunately, maybe what you're describing is a sense of that there is injustice happening. And so people choose not to talk about it. And so if we don't reinforce that type of information, and it's the same with our own, own memories, if we don't reinforce and rehearse some of our memories, then those memories uh, weaken over time and, and we, we forget about them. Um, and what we tend to, we, we can often choose what we want to remember. Um, so there's a lot of work out there where people say, can we suppress certain memories? Can we enhance certain memories? And so the ones that give us the joy, the ones that we think other people will enjoy listening to, the ones which are um, politically correct, for example, those are the ones that people like to, to talk about a lot. Um, uh, and so those are the memories that are that are strengthened, and those are the ones that propagate. And unfortunately, memories or events that you describe of, unfortunately, those are the ones that that get destroyed and and not talked about as much. And, and, I, and I think that raises the issue very often of whose memory is it? Is does one have one's own memory? Does one have parents' memories, ancestral memories? Who, whose whose memory do we think? is what we are recalling and registering and being imprinted by. Yeah. Richard? Richard. Um, of course, one can have one's memory impaired, but I think the whole question of what is forgetting 
is another issue. But I'd like also to introduce this idea, which comes to me from having read Jonathan Fuller's book, um, Moon, Moonwalking with Einstein, when he talks about the power of memory. And in our introductions, we talked about people who talked about um, failures of memory or where the memory faculty is hurt. But he says, well, not only did the ancient Greeks have a god of memory because they thought it was so important, but we know whether it's um, from chess players or lorry drivers playing air chess um, or even taxi drivers who um, you probably know in London have to um, take a particular test. They have to learn all the places and all the streets in the city. Um, and it's been tested or shown that um, taxi drivers have expanded brains um, through having trained their facility in this way. But when they give up their career as taxi drivers, um, that expansion shrinks again. And it raises the question of to what extent can we build up our powers of memory? If we've got people like um, taxi drivers or chess players um, improving their memory, or conjurers indeed, what can we do to make our, our mem the memory faculty of our brains more powerful and be able to do more with them? So Richard, um, so you actually doesn't take much effort to change your brain at a physical level. You can practice violin for two days and change the amount of your brain. You can physically demonstrate more area of your brain de you know, devoted to that practice. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, which you brought up um, and wanted to emphasize is you know, we all tend to prize memory, including the ancient Greeks, but forgetting is just as important for remembering. And to be able to forget and to be able to normally forget is important for learning. I mean, if we didn't forget to crawl, you know, um, and we're willing to, then we wouldn't have learned to walk. If we didn't forget our first love, it would be hard to fall in love again. Um, so forgetting is very, if we forgot, if we didn't forget to babble, you know, it would be harder to learn to, so it's important to understand. And there's this whole emphasis in modern society of having to remember and, you know, and memory being equated with intelligence um, and, and kind of um, to the detriment of the importance of forgetting. So um, I, I'd like to be a proponent of that forgetting is very good for us and important uh, for our brain. Um, and there's a wonderful book by um, Luria, a Russian um, uh, psychologist called The Mind of the Mnemonist. And he talks about a patient or, or a man who was studied who forgot how to forget. And it significantly interfered with his ability to function in a daily, um, in a productive way on a daily basis. I'd like to teach my dogs to remember commands better. Alexandra, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and not forget. You know that yeah, you also I... remind me of uh, the Borges story, Funes the Memorias, right? Where, where he represents a character who could not forget and actually how crippling it was and, and disabling of being able to act. Um, and there are a lot of questions that have already come up, but I, I mean, to the, to the sort of how do we remember better, how does a non-human remember better, that's so interesting because I think it has a lot to do with our directing of their attention, right, and our inability to realize what is salient to them in order to um, allow for the encoding, um, which will which which is easy for them to do. Like they can easily learn to <coughs> learn commands, learn to remember commands. But we're not always as good at creating an environment which um, allows them to pick up on the salient cues. Um, but if I can also just add one other thing to this, like interestingly frothy sea of ideas, um, it was something that Setsko and, and Andy were hitting on about. Um, a cultural memory and how exclusion of people from a cultural history is, is a kind of power um, that those who are doing the excluding have over the excluded. And I was thinking about how um, it, when studying non-human animals, 
there's always a question of whether they have memory at all, right? And this is partially because we can't ask animals to do memory tasks and give us verbal responses, as are many of our memory tasks, right? And so even though non-human animals are studied for their memory as analogs to human memory, still when I will be asked about dogs, you know, do they, can they remember anything which is, which is ridiculous. Of course they can. I mean, all their behavior evinces it. But because we can't see into their brains, we kind of assume that maybe there's an absence there. And I'm wondering if the sort of way we disallow nonverbal others from having memory is similar to the kind of historical exclusion, uh, memorial exclusion of peoples from our history. I'm just seeing an interesting analog there. I li I'd like to say something here because I was shaking my head because there is so much work done on memories in non-human animals, and of course they have memories. Uh, we can we can say that they are not talking to us, but that's just one single way to express memories. Memories is how to do things, is how to recognize places, is how to navigate spaces. We have tons and tons of evidence in non-human animals that they have memories, and memories are like any other thing, evolutionarily conserved. And there is so much studies uh, ongoing to understand uh, the biological basis of memories that have shown that in different species, there are a number of conserved biological mechanisms. So certainly they're not declarative memories, but we, I, I, you know, I disagree to even doubt that the, that non-human animals have memories. Um, and mm -hmm. I want to bring uh, to one more point, which I think it was brought up in terms of um, memories and <clears throat> the subjectivity, the individual ways of memorizing and remembering and processing information. I'm not sure we choose to do that. Uh, I'm not sure it's a choice because a lot of our representations and memories are implicit. So we're not conscious of it. So we don't have choice in that sense. It's the unconscious part of the brain that guides our decisions. And, and those are, <clears throat> of course, based on experiences and recollection of memories and, and experiences we have over and over or new experiences that we have at some point. We react in certain ways according to our history. That's why it's very individualized. So we are studying now in the lab something that to me is very exciting, and that is how the memory system establish itself. How do they form? How does it mature? And so we are looking at the biology of uh, episodic memories in rats and mice. Uh, at the age of infancy, when we know that those memories are formed but rapidly forgotten. And this very rapid forgetting is believed to be the, the reason for infantile amnesia. The, 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 uh, the, the process, I don't know how to call it, the, the phenomenon by which as adults, we do not recall experiences of the first, let's say, three years of life. Uh, and Freud gave the first explanation of infantile amnesia. Um, um, we don't think it, it, it now is in agreement with what we see. So, but now we, have, we are studying the biology of these memories forming the first uh, few days corresponding to the first few years of life in humans, and found that there is, in fact, the very conserved, evolutionarily conserved, rapid forgetting. The animals learn, and they forget very rapidly, compared to later ages. And when we look at the biology, we found that the biology is very interesting and unique, different than the other ages. They use mechanism of so-called critical periods. Those are temporal windows in life in which the brain is particularly responsive to experience. And with these responses, it matures the functions. So let's say the visual system that has been studied a lot in the critical period. We are born, we don't see the way we see in adulthood. And through 
seeing, through the function of seeing, so uh, all the stimulus that go in through the eyes and the brain, those shapes the brain to the point that, uh, that you know, when he's matured, is able to function like in adulthood. So we find the same similar mechanisms in uh, our experiments of episodic learning and memories. So what this tells us is that during this temporal window, we better have the best stimuli and experiences to mature our abilities to learn and remember. And, and, and we tested and found that it is the type of experience that matures the function. In other words, if they are exposed to one type of experience, they mature the ability to memorize like adults that type, that domain of experiences, but not other types that are processed by the same system. So there's Christina, a very, could I ask, can one will oneself to forget? Can what? Can one will oneself to forget? Decide to forget? Can one make oneself forget? Well, I'm, I'm sure if you, if you start saying, I'm going to change my attention and not um, pay attention to, to whatever you want to exclude, over time, that will lead to more forgetting than if you don't do that. But that is one single, you know, it, it's a small, um, how do, what do I want to say? It's a small um, uh, part of the memories compared to all the memories we have. The memories we have is the expression of the experiences. And our brain is molded according to the experiences we have. And during these critical periods, what we see is key for the development of the function. Um, you Can know, I, Rich, I, I just wanted to say something to Richard for a moment. In Ovid's Metamorphosis, the ability to forget is really described. You're meant to drink of the river of Lethe. And that was a major part of the Orphic, the whole Orphic experience of creative transformation. And so all of those metamorphoses, all those transformations depended in Ovid on that ability to forget. So I think that that's been part of our, our sort of um, more reflective experience of memory in the brain. Now that's a good pickup. There's an actual book by David Reif um, called In Praise of Forgetting. Yes, and yes. He makes he makes the point that remembering um, is a barrier to reconciliation, whether it's between nations, between couples or whatever, which is why that part of memory is so important. Yes, and in no. with patients, you often get that someone cannot forgive and then they get to an age where they forget and then there's reconciliation. Actually, one of the happiest, you know, one of the keys to happiness I found in older patients is the ability to forgive, to mm -hmm. truly forgive and forget. Yeah. Um, and the one other point I wanted to make for Richard's question was um, that forgetting is an is almost an unconscious incessant, constant process. As we're listening right now, there are so many things that we're forgetting. I'm forgetting the, the way the light falls in the room. I forget the number of, you know, the colors on the, the screen, et cetera. So it's an incessant, constant process. Unlearning is a little bit more conscious. So to decide- Can I, can I just- Is can a I, little different. Yeah. Can I just join in about, um, well, I want to say, con uh, um, the idea of forgetting. I mean, they say that if you cannot forget the pain of childbirth, you would probably never have another child again. <laughs> and so forgetting is part of the process of living, you know. Um, and as for forgiving, I think part of the problem of, of memory and forgetting or forgiving is that you can't forgive unless you knew in the first place. And what happens if your nation is constantly telling you that whatever you think you remember didn't happen, which happened to me a lot at NPR, where I was told that, you know, the four freedoms and, you know, injustice and didn't, doesn't, 
happen in America because, you know, we had four freedoms in America. And I just wrote a, an opinion piece in my local paper, paper, the Berkshire Eagle. You might want to take a look at that. But there were a lot of people who were excluded from those four freedoms. And but we continuously say that uh, that doesn't happen in America. So what happens if the forgetting is imposed on you from the outside? You know, you haven't chosen to forget for, for, um, to forget it. Or, you know, you're not allowed to, if, you, if it's, it's like gaslighting, it didn't happen, so you can't forgive because it never happened in the first place. So it creates this odd catch-22. And, and I've been looking into the Japanese-American experience, and it's really, really um, bizarre. It's like watching the movie Gaslight, where they keep saying, you know, this happened, and they're being told, no, it didn't. It doesn't happen here in America. And, uh, you know, that's happened to Asian people for most of American history. Um, it's uh, their Native American history is, uh, and the laws written against them, is mimics what they use against Asians. I, we're, we're talking a great deal about time, about memory and time, different temporal periods. And I'm wondering about memory and space. Andy, could, could you say something about that? And maybe Alexandra, how is it that when you're taking your dog to the vet, as soon as you get two blocks away, the dog begins to shake because there's something about the space of the approach. And in terms of what it's like to be a person of several cultures, whether ancestrally or in terms of one's own life and the effect of space where you are, or you forget something, you have to go back into the room where you first thought of it before you could pick up the memory of what it, why you, you moved to the other room. Andy, could you say a few things about this? Yeah, so I guess the way that we, we often conceive of memory, um, and now I'm talking about episodic memory, so personally experienced memories or the biographical memory, people often talk about the, the what, where, and, and when. Um, so when did something happen, which is the time which we've been talking about, uh, the what actually happened, um, and of course, the where. And, and the where often has uh, really become a, a prominent piece, um, historically, at least in, in memory research. A lot of this driven by, um, so cells in the hippocampus, which seem to indicate the spatial location of an animal um, in an environment. And so a lot of research has really been driven by, by the what, uh, sorry, the where, which is the spatial piece. And just in terms of what you were talking about, um, that really speaks to uh, the fact that we, we learn associations. So a lot of our memories are associations between different pieces of information. And because space is so pervasive, so we, you know, even where we're sitting now, as we walk around, we're in a space in a particular location, often our memories get anchored that way. So there, we have certain associations associated with certain locations. And so therefore, when we either retrieve those memories or we go into certain locations, those may, may trigger those associations to come back. So in, in the case of the dog example you're giving, I mean, Alexandra will be able to speak a lot more to that than I would, but just being in, in a certain location um, could trigger certain memories associated with, with approaching uh, a particular target spatial location. Um, so, so that's probably what's, what's going on, on there. Um, and so the way a lot of cognitive neuroscientists think about memory is that we almost like have a memory map in our brains where it's a combination of this spatial information with this temporal information, which, which gets bound together as almost like the, the scaffolding of our memories and lots of other pieces of information that can attach to us. So like emotions, whether something's rewarding or not rewarding, for example. Um, so they all get put together in, into this big memory map. But, but space is a, is a key component of this map. And certainly in terms of experiences that are traumatic, I think space and perception, of course, has a huge effect in that way. And Alexandra, could you help us out with what is it in dog memory that seems to be spatially related? Well, I mean, Andy has said it best, and he's the neuro neuroscientist here. And of course, what I liked uh, about what he said was this emphasis on learning through association. So memories being triggered by an association, which is a way that we think of um, sometimes non-human animals learning more than ourselves. But that is, of course, analogous or identical 
in in non humans and in humans that we learn through associations. And so it is not at all surprising that dogs can remember uh, arriving at a vet or a person who they've met once or being in a place um, that they've been before and had a bad experience. <clears throat> that shouldn't surprise us at all. And I think what I what I'm interested in in your question, Beverly, is sort of why would we be surprised by that? And I think it's mm-hmm. because we don't think some, in some level, we're not thinking about companion animals or, or non-human animals <laughs> as having kind of personal stories, right? Autobiographical memories that they um, ruminate on, that they sit back and reflect on. And, and that's only because, well, we, we're not sure if they do have a kind of sense of self over time, right? We, and they don't have a, a verbal way to express that. Um, but also be, because we are familiar with each other's um, autobiographical selves through analogy and through our telling each other about our, our history and our experiences. So we just have to look at dog behavior and realize that their behavior is showing us their memory. But we often aren't, we're not as accustomed to that, to seeing other others' memories uh, visible just in their behavior we're used to seeing their memories visible in how they respond and how they articulate their experiences. We, we started off and made a very important distinction between explicit memories and implicit memories. And, um, but you'll notice that as we go along in the conversation, we tended to default to, when we mostly talk about memory, we default to sort of explicit memories. And I wonder when we talked about create, creative memory and destructive memory, we'll call it, where 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 are we mostly referring to explicit memories, and is that same creativity found in implicit memories on the one hand? And right, do dogs, for example, have some degree of explicit memory? That's sort of what Alexandra is commenting on just now. I just wondered if we could talk about that creative uh, aspect of implicit versus explicit. Well, Socrates, um, when people started to write things down, was disgusted because he said. If you memorize things, take things into yourself as a memory, you experience them more deeply than when you see it um, on a tablet or whatever. And I'm wondering what other panelists feel about that, whether in our day-to-day rush of taking in information and not particularly memorizing it, we're losing in the depth of our response to it. Richard, so one of the things that we um, need to think about is how intricately in the way the brain has developed, um, memory is tied to emotion. Um, So the amygdala, Joel Ledoux at NYU has done a lot of work on this in terms of how the amygdala is tied to memory and it allows organisms, including including, uh, dogs, um, I wouldn't call them lesser animals, greater animals, to um, to evolve and survive and adapt. So, um, so in terms of how you know the feeling of something, taking it in with Socrates, it would have to do with the emotion. How much you imbue this memory uh, with some kind of emotion? How relevant it is to you, um, as opposed to facts, memories for facts. Uh, which are sometimes devoid of any kind of emotion, unless it means you have to study to take an exam. Um, so that is important, I think, in terms of the distinction between um, um, how well we remember things and how much emotion plays a role in remembering. Um, Alexandra, I have a question. Do you think that um, dogs have more of an emotional memory than people do? Sort of because of their absence of uh, articulating yeah. themselves, telling the story of to themselves, we yeah. assume. Um, I I I have to be agnostic about that. I think I think that what I'm I would imagine is more of the dog's experience is a kind of fuller fleshed uh, perceptual memory. In other words, in modalities that maybe don't always occur to us as part of memory formation. So, for instance, olfaction, right? where, of course, olfaction is a big driver of learned associations. And can we all can talk about that Proustian moment, right, uh, or a moment from childhood, an early memory that is invoked by a scent that you encounter again. Um, but that's actually fairly rare. We don't do, we're, we're not daily creating olfactory 
memory, olfactorily primed memories. Um, but I, but of course, if if one is an animal who is more living in that modality, I think that they are. Um, and so, insofar as olfaction is actually closely tied to emotions, you know, perhaps so. It's, um, but uh, I don't think any there would be any reason that they'd be more emotional per se, right? versus analytic, if, if that's the contrast you're drawing. It depends who their owners are. Hmm. Can I, can I? <laughs> I would like to, you know, may, please. Uh, I would like to ask uh, something that was triggered by what uh, Gayatra said about emotion. She at first said that uh, you, in terms of your first uh, romance, that you forget that in order to be able to have other romances. Now, what what is it you forget? You still may remember the name of the person. <laughs> you may recognize the person in the street. Uh, you may remember some of the places you went out together to. <laughs> but not, what you don't have is the emotions that you had at the time. So what's, and you mentioned emotional memory. So how do we understand emotional memory versus what is more cognitive memory? Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask, and this has been on my mind for a few years and I haven't found sufficient, I haven't been able to understand it for myself sufficiently, is what Christina mentioned about experience. So that experience with the first uh, love of your life can continue to have an impact on you for a period of time. Do you consider that memory or do you consider that something else? Those are the two thoughts I wanted to see if there could be some clarification for me on it. And I don't know if I can offer clarification, but I can certainly comment a little bit on it. Um, I think we're ultimately all mammals, dogs, humans, and we really have this large overlay of our neocortex, which tries to bring rationality to our decisions. I mean, Daniel Kahneman has written about this in Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, that we try to rationalize our very basic instinctual behavior by giving it a narrative that fits in with our thinking at the moment. But it's really ultimately quite emotional the science of economics is emotional, even though we think of economics as a very dry subject. Um, so, uh, so, I th so to answer your question or to try to talk about it a little bit, um, when you're talking about emotions and how they uh, affect memory, um, it makes, it appeals more to the core brain, more to the primitive brain, um, and um, it's harder to erase which is why PTSD is such an issue because it's the you know strong connection with emotion. And that's why repression, Freud's famous stories of repression are also an issue because it's a negative suppression, if you will, of memory. So that's my thinking. I don't know what else. You wanted to say something? Yes, me? Yeah. Yes. Um, no, I, I would. Sorry, go ahead. Sets go. You were trying to say something before. Oh. Um, no, I, well, it's, that's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Go ahead, Christina. Yeah, to add to what was just said, uh, uh, if, if, if there is no emotion or valence, emotional valence, there is no long-term memory. Uh, motivation is based on emotion. So if there is no motivation, there's not going to be any long-term memory. There has been also a lot of experiments done looking at the level of stress and memory strength. And what they have found is that a little bit of stress or emotion, negative emotion in some cases when they've been measured as aversive memories uh, or positive in other, in other experiments, is essential to have long-term memories. And increasing the level of stress or emotion to a certain point is beneficial to have more memories, more detailed memories, more long lasting memories. And after a certain level of stress, then there is a decrease of memory 
strength and uh, uh, and uh, and storage, or at least they are not expressed anymore. So it's like an inverted U effect. A little bit of stress and emotion is necessary to to store me- long term memories. Too much is bad because then we distort the memories, and and the storage is only on certain. Um, uh, representations or cues or whatever it is that, that, that the experience was, and it can be also sort of inhibited, uh, probably for a defensive mechanisms. Let's say a very a very strong trauma. Um, if we ask what happened after that traumatic experience, often they say, "I don't remember." No, but I was trying to comment on the on the very simple thing, which is uh, Devi's exa- uh, Gayatri's example, you have, so you have your first uh, romance. Yes. You remember a lot about that, but you yes. don't have the emotion. So well, how do you, how comes you don't have the emotions? If in you, other if words, what? whatever intense loving feelings you have, you don't have anymore. In fact, Gayatri said, if you continue to have them, you couldn't move on. Well, and also, oh, can I, very oh. many of those early ex- love experiences turn into obsessions. I think that's a whole other. Yeah, that, that's, that's a whole that's other. other. <laughs> right. I think it, I think it I, depends, but for, for the sake of the discussion, yeah, let's say that there is no emotional memory. Then the question is, do you think that's memory? Yes, absolutely. Everything that memory by definition is whatever is, uh, m- stored and maintained over time, and therefore that maintaining of that information will influence our behavior in the present moment. Yeah. Um, can I? Yes. I, I remembered what I was thinking about emotion, and I think it's that it's not that you forget that the emotional feeling. You probably just transfer it onto someone else. Mm-hmm. You know, because I know. I remember how I felt in my first love. And I know that maybe I don't feel that way about this other person because there's a lot of other memories that are piled on top of that original love that no longer makes me feel that way. But I remember that feeling. And when I meet somebody else and that feeling is there, it's it's not that you lost it. It's just that you're now associating it with somebody else. And oh, Andy, can I just bring up one more thing? The other thing about emotion is what if your the emotion that's associated with you is fear and um, hatred, and um, which is what I often experienced um, growing up. Uh, when I was eight years old, I was walking home from school and somebody wrote in chalk, sets goes a Jap, Jap go home. Um, this was in, you know, the early 70s and uh, no, 60s, late 60s. And um, it turns out it was my neighbors. It was two girls that lived in my neighborhood. And I'm not sure why they wrote that um, other than that maybe they learned it from their parents. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've even growing up and, you know, going to journalism school, I didn't learn any, a lot of this history, um, anti-Asianism that was legal or um, most of the uh, history that I learned about Asians was negative and fear-based. Um, and I still get it today. I've been to dinner parties in the Berkshires where people said, um, oh, the Japanese, you had to be put away, you know, Pearl Harbor. Or the Japanese, had you had to be nuked, you know. Um, so to me, that's really scary. Um, and I guess to them, it's perfectly fine because I'm associated with uh, people and a memory that triggers fear. So what do you do when that is constantly applied to you? Even though I, I, was, I wasn't born then, I promise I'm not scary. <laughs> Andy, did you wanna, you wanted to respond there? I just wanted to add something really quickly um, in response to basically uh, Ed's question earlier about, um, you know, moving along from a past romance. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one potential factor which may help us do that as well uh, is that often our memories transform over time. So when we think about our episodic memories, the way 
like cognitive scientists think about that is that you you have a re-experiencing of the event. So maybe emotions come back. Uh, people talk about jumping back in time. We put ourselves back when we experience that relationship, perhaps, and all those memories flood back. But what often happens to those types of memories as well is that over time, they begin to transform in the sense that they may become uh, more semanticized. So they become more knowledge, not entirely knowledge, but they they lean more towards that end as opposed to the more personal experience uh, end. And I guess the extreme of that would be if uh, you see a, a photograph of your childhood and someone asks you about it. Sometimes you can actually remember experiencing it, but sometimes you just remember, oh yeah, that was my birthday party. I was five and I got a great present, but it's unclear whether you actually experienced that yourself or is that someone telling you that that's what happened and that became your memory. Right. And so there's that distinction between like a factual memory versus a personal experience memory. And perhaps maybe that's what happens with, you know, some of the relationships way past is that over time they transform a little bit. We detach from them slightly personally. Those emotions, uh, depending on how the relationship ended, um, maybe it was an amicable relationship or whether it wasn't that may influence things. But maybe one factor is that those memories become a little bit more, slightly more semanticized. And those those emotions that were attached with it, we don't re-experience them again. And so that then allows us to, to you know, put that relationship in the past and, and move on to a new one. No, I'm sure that's true. One remembers a memory. It's like remembering the photocopy rather than, rather than the real thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, was, I was wondering how much we could say that that fact that you just described where memories are sort of fungible, that that's a feature of explicit memory as opposed to implicit memory. I'm trying to tease that out. Yeah. We, we might open this up now to questions from the audience. Um, they probably have some of the same questions that we do. Jerry, do you, is this the moment to include the audience? I think that sounds like a good idea. Um, let's see, I think that, here we are. Our I think Alex has some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have the questions collected. Just want to thank everyone who's viewing through Zoom and on YouTube. Thank you for the comments and questions. So um, I've recorded them as we've gone through the Zoom. So if you wrote more than one, I'm going to uh, state your first one and then go through everyone else's and hopefully if we have time, get to the others again. Um, there will be some editing on my part just for time's sake. So Please forgive me there. And also, if I mangle any pronunciations of names in advance, I apologize. Okay, so um, the first one was from S. Mason Dambrot, and uh, they asked, are you familiar with research showing applying metformin to a type 1 diabetic this delays the oncoming of Alzheimer's? Uh, if so, please comment on this uh, process. So I'll just briefly mention that there's a lot of research now on um, insulin resistance and um, various risk factors for developing dementia and metformin and drugs like that are helpful in this area. Um, so um, there's still a lot of research to be done here. Okay, then um, just a comment to bring some levity to the conversation. Um, Vicki Madden had wrote early on, practically everyone I know has gotten a pandemic puppy. So that's not a question, but I think that's a nice, a nice comment to add. Um, she asked the question, but unfortunately she's a little later on, so hopefully you get to her question. But the next one was from Manon uh, Slome. Um, is selective memory, not in a pejorative sense, a defense mechanism? I would say the analysts in our audience are best to take this, no? Well, I think in a way we've already addressed it, that in order to, to keep going, we tend to take in what we think we can handle in the moment. And one of the very compelling aspects in this pandemic period is how many suppressed memories have come forth now. I think there's something about the isolation. There's something about the amount of empathy we feel for others uh, that is somehow it's enough of a hothouse experience that what we didn't think about before because we had to keep going is now emerging and coming up. I don't know if others are having that, that experience as well. And yes, I was saying to Alexander earlier that I've never seen a period of time where 
so many people became so dependent on the um, in con- unconditional affection of their pets in, pro- in part because it's so difficult for people to be together in such, uh, you know, an intense way that it's almost as if the, the dogs become some kind of mediator in the situation. Oh, yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's exactly right. They are a symbol of a time before and the ease of dealing with others and they have become the others the social presence, right, who who are near and we can touch. I think it's also interesting to remember that they are also dogs who are experiencing this time for themselves, but new puppies are not experiencing a pandemic. They don't know it's an unusual time, right? So their memory of this time, this is this is the ordinary life for them. And, and I think that is will be an interesting dissonance, unfortunately, if we kind of unquarantine and we assume that they are adjusted and ready to to um, live life by themselves, for instance. But the question about selective memory goes back to the fact that um, one's brain, the memory part of one's brain, is constantly transforming and reorganizing and goes back to what one of us was saying earlier about the experience of childbirth. I don't think, for what I can put together, that women forget childbirth but they relegate it for the health of their life in the present and the future. So it's not a forgotten memory, but in as much that one's brain or one's memory part of one's brain seems like a complex computer, it's refiling certain experiences so that they're not immediately upon us. I do believe, Richard, that we do actually forget severe pain, you know, the, the physical pain of childbirth. Um, it's hard to recreate. As speaking as you know, someone, it's really, really hard to recreate the intensity of the pain immediately afterward. Um, it can happen, but it's rare from a neurologic perspective. I, I would uh, assume. I would assume that pain essentially stops when it stops. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but to add to what Richard was saying, the forgetting that happens in the first few years of life, this leads to infantile amnesia. Uh, That is actually an apparent forgetting. You're right. We have tested uh, these memories that are apparently gone. If you give reminders later on in life to these animals, the memories come back. I remember we had a patient who spoke German for, um, grew up in Germany came to the United States when he was 14 or 13, learned English, really forgot all of his German, um, or maybe he was even younger, maybe he was seven or eight, and then he had a stroke. And um, the only thing he could speak in was in German. And it was very hard for his family who didn't understand any German. So to your point that you know we really never forget anything, it's just our ability to retrieve things, including emotion is much harder Uh, over time. And what Jerry had asked earlier about the difference between explicit and implicit memory and its attachment to emotion, I think of implicit procedural memory as something that's uh, a cable as as opposed to explicit memory, which for the most part, memory for events and facts uh, is much more like a cobweb. Um, And cables are often laid down better if they are wrapped in an insulation of emotion. So <laughs> that's, um, a, that's a great I, one. Yeah, I just want to um, add to the um, idea of suppressed memory. I'm, I'm not a memory expert, obviously, but in looking at the history that I've been examining for the last uh, 10 years, um, a lot of the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated by their own government just for being Japanese, um, uh, did suppress that they they had they suppressed it on purpose and they didn't teach it to their children just so that they could survive um, and move on with their lives. It was it was essential. It was a survive definitely a survival mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Can I I you know there's something that Gayatri brought up that I I this is a language issue that I've always been interested in as a cognitive scientist is which is the sort of two sides of thinking about 
selective attention and forgetting. So you earlier said sort of we're forgetting, and I and I agree with this, we're forgetting a lot of what's happening right now, right? So we're all experiencing in theory something of the same. We're in the same moment. We can see each other. There's some overlap in our experience, but we're sort of not attending to some. Is that, do you think, do you think it's the same? It's appropriate to say that what's happened is we're forgetting that already because in fact, it's not been in, encoded, really. It's not been explicitly encoded. We're, it, it hasn't been rehearsed by us. So it's sort of almost that it's just never experienced in a way. It's as though it's never experienced at all. And that's the type mm -hmm. of thing that can't be brought back, right, later. But I do feel right. like there's a, right. a sort of slipperiness exactly. with language around selective attention and selective forgetting. That question mm -hmm. brought it up. And just attention and, and how memory is encoded to begin with. Well, also, I, I feel like our experience of the pandemic is probably different than, you know, an essential workers who has to get up every day and, you know, go to a hospital or something like that. I mean, I feel lucky that I just get to stay in my Berkshire home. <laughs> <laughs> and it's I, I don't have those memories that an essential worker has because I never experienced it. I think, Alex, we should go to the questions. Yeah, yeah. So um, next one was from Esther Dyson. I guess this is more of a comment, but I could turn it into a question. I think it would be interesting, given Richard's uh, mention in passing about computers. Um, they said as they're listening to the intros, they they thought like the quote unquote editing sounds is more like attaching things to a framework and the recognition of objects as an AI. So I guess a question would be like, how do you think the formulation of how humans form memories relates to how an AI works, or I guess like a, a deep learning network? I'd say the primary difference would be that um, there's no emotion involved with an AI. So that, and that's a huge difference. Um, and, you know, obviously the richness of the parallel distributed networks that both humans and more advanced AI systems share um, are, are obviously AI systems are evolving and they're learning fuzzy logic, they're learning to learn, uh, but emotion is the big difference, you know, between the two systems. I don't know, Andy, Christine, the rest of you. Andy, what do you think? I agree. And, and I would say, I mean, just speaking practically, I would say that the way that we, as, as humans, the way we do it, it far exceeds anything that, that, uh, like a deep neural network could do. I mean, there are studies out there on, on babies and how they do statistical learning, how just repeating stuff and they pick up patterns that enables babies to learn language, for example, it far exceeds anything that you could throw at, like an ability of a deep neural network to recognize objects. Um, so I think some of the principles are shared, but in the human brain, it's it's expanded and more complex in a way that we're only beginning to scrape the surface of, of how some of that learning occurs. Okay, so the next um, question, I, sorry if I didn't mention, the last one was from Esther Dyson. This is from Amy Olson. Could you please speak to the phenomenon of phantom limbs and how the mind remembers a body part there is no, that is no longer present, but is perceived as if it were? So phantom limbs, is that the question? Yeah, sorry, phantom so, limbs, yeah. So, uh, you know, as I'd mentioned before, our realities are our brains, right? So if our brain thinks that we have pain, we have pain. So um, if the brain thinks we have a limb, we do have that limb. So there's a part, so there have been um, numerous studies, which I won't go into, but basically attesting to this that, um, and the brain is unable to differentiate, for example, between social rejection versus actual pain, because the same area of the singlet cortex lights up. Um, the brain doesn't assign a difference, which I think is very interesting in terms of pain, um, in terms of the emotional circuitry involved between physical pain and emotional pain. They both coalesce in certain parts of the brain. Um, so phantom limb just means that that part of your brain still thinks you have, um, you have a limb attached. Um, and that's why chronic pain is such an interesting condition to treat because even when the nascent event is no longer, you know, it's, it's, it's gone, the brain can elaborate on the pain and make it as large or as winnowed down as it chooses to. Um, and it's not a conscious process. Can you make it conscious? 
Um, that's an interesting question. You know, all kinds of, you can remember many things uh, by rehearsing, you know, the idea of changing an explicit declarative memory, like how do you learn to play the violin to an implicit cable type memory um, involves rehearsal. Um, so yeah, I would imagine you can, I mean, you can, uh, one of the things that I work on is in terms of changing um, the brain's perception of chronic pain. And one of the ways we do that is by using brain stimulation to turn down the area of the brain that perceives the pain without actually doing anything about the, um, the actual event that's causing the pain, whether it's a neuropathy uh, or an amputated limb um, for, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, everything happens in our brain, whether it's real or not, mm -hmm. <laughs> which sounds kind of silly to have to say, but it's hard for us to uh, truly grasp, I think sometimes. Christina, do you have thoughts you'd like to add to this? No? Okay. Oh, I think she did a fantastic job. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, Dave asked, how can one forget or change a negative memory? I think, do, do you want to answer that? I think it's been sort of fleshed out through the conversation. So just to note that I got your question, Dave, there. Um, Sachin Prathaban, sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, apart from cues of survival or for survival, excuse me, is there a reason we were inbred with memory? What are we here to remember being on earth for? I'm not sure I understood the question. What's the reason to have memories? Yeah, what's the biological necessity for memory? The biological reason is to survive. But if we in addition, in memories, in we will not be they want to know in addition to survival. So besides survival, is there any other uh, a reason? Well, consciousness. Not, I mean, Ed, Gerald Edmund called consciousness the remembered present, mm -hmm. suggesting that we're experiencing, reflecting, and remembering all at once. And that's what consciousness is. You know, if you ask the question, what's it for? It looks to me like the only sort of obvious answer would be for survival. It may do other things other than promote survival. And I think that's what makes it a lot of fun. Obviously, we don't remember. Or not fun, as the case may be. But I mean, isn't memory like, you know, does a rock have a memory? So maybe, you know, because we're animals. Well, you know, we've evolved differently. A rock doesn't have to cross the road. And if you didn't have exactly. memory... Exactly. Um, <laughs> but, of course, the one thing that remains are all the arguments about where consciousness comes from, which we still haven't resolved. Mm -hmm. Andy, do you have thoughts you'd like to insert here? Not in particular. I, I would say that the survival is, is the main piece. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so next one is from Vicky Madden. Um, they were curious about dream remembrance. So they said, um, the, is the reason why they potentially forget memories or the way that they retain memories is that they have to tell it to themselves and put it to language right away. And if they don't, they'll forget it. So like, how does one go about remembering a dream? Um. This is the idea that that uh, somehow speaking of it or talking, verbalizing a memory does something, goes some way towards uh, instantiating it or creating. I, I once did a dream sleepover seminar at the Rubin Museum of Art, where we were right there with people waking up, just as they were waking up, which is very different than seeing patients in your office. And they would report the dream while they were waking up. And then the next morning, we would have a group and everyone would discuss or say, report their dream. The content in every case was exactly the same. What changed was the linear time sequence. So that when the person was waking up, they said, this happened. But before that, this happened. Before that, this happened. And then when they told the dream in the morning, it was 
like a linear narrative that that was very interesting so i think you know some of what seems so ridiculous in dream memory is actually because we're changing the time sequence we're looking at it from the waking time sequence so i think if you accept that where there's an anomaly then there's more of a tendency to be open to your dreams and to record them remember them yeah um if i could just share a story my husband loves trains he's a train fanatic and he made us watch this a uh, documentary about the bullet train in Japan and supposedly since its um invention and uh inception it has had i think only one death um accident and which is pretty remarkable considering Japan has the most earthquakes of any nation in the world and they said that one of the things that they do and i've seen this on tri- on local trains in Japan where um the conductor points at something and then he says something and then um it's like the point and there's something to with verbalizing and pointing um that they do and we kept looking like who is he talking to because he didn't have earphones he didn't have anything and it turns out that it's a memory uh aid and now they use it at hospitals with prescriptions you they make you look at the name you say it out loud and then you point again and it improved the accuracy by i don't know how many fold so us reading it looking at it and then verbalizing it actually does something to the memory process yeah and so i wanted to just say something really interesting and i never knew yeah. this and yeah. i don't know if you ever experienced this but I had a, a graduate student who uh-huh. is now in medical school uh-huh. uh, and he grew up in Japan and he came uh-huh. to the United States when he was in his 20s mm-hmm. and he had trouble he had to unlearn mm-hmm. the difference between L and R he actually had a lot of trouble pronouncing well there R. is no well in no, Japan it was, it was just I thought it was so interesting that no in Japan there is no r or an l there's only in between there's a da di do de do it's not a l and it's not an r and what so, he said is he had trouble hearing the difference yeah, yeah. so he couldn't hear the r or the l so right. a lot of times he had to put it in the context so i right, thought that was right. fascinating because it's not something you routinely think about so. no but also Alex, uh, we'll move on to the next question yeah. oh sorry yeah um So uh Elizabeth Manis asked is there a distinct well I think this actually is a good uh piggyback off what guy she was talking about is there a distinction between forgetting and unlearning Richard do you have a sense of that as a historian Again going back to willfulness or rather the exercise of one's will um there was a british officer in the um early to mid 19th century who was going through um a, a, a section of europe and he was saying to them well can you he said to one man can you remember napoleon and the man said yes he was well over 6 foot tall with long blonde hair and anyway what he wanted to remember was um a conquering general looking like a viking god so he um unconsciously created this image which had nothing to do with with fact except the fact of what he thought a conquering um officer should look like so uh, to that extent um one can unconsciously will a memory mm, mm interesting yeah and Oliver Sacks talks about um reciting to members of the family various events in their shared past and the family saying but you weren't there <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's the same process mm-hmm. it would like to have been mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. might we also say that forgetting is a larger category and unlearning to the degree it's a separate thing it's a sub subset of all forgetting 
Does that sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds okay. good. Unlearning means that we have learned something and then we unlearn. <laughs> Forgetting is part of many processes. One of the things, you'll remember the famous line in Death of a Salesman, um, when the wife says, attention must be paid. And one of the aspects of learning and unlearning is paying attention. Um, we've all seen on Andy's wall, above um, the television set and the bookcases, um, a number of telephones. But did we pay attention to the fact that he has four telephones out of reach in his living room? No, but I saw the gorilla walk by. I don't know if the rest of you saw that gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So maybe it's the gorilla in the room, not the elephant in the room. <laughs> well, I think we've come to the end of our time. Well, can we get one or two more questions or are you... If you would like to, uh, yeah, I think there's. I, I could pick sort of two. So apologies to the others, but I think there's sort of two um, that could be, I think, interesting. So one was from Robert Mazziotti. Um, you wrote a long thing, but I think I can understand what he's saying. It is probably best answered by Christina. Um, he was sort of curious about the physiological process of explicit memory recall, and he was I, what he's referring to. I'm pretty sure is like structural changes with protein. So I think was I think what he's alluding to is with LTP, a long-term potentiation causing uh, protein fold changes, and I think he was curious whether such protein fold changes are what leads to recall, right? So that the certain position of the protein over time is what leads to recall. I, I that's some, I'm assuming also I've had some experience in neuroscience research myself in my master's. So I, I've read this before, so I think that's what he's referring to. Yes, I'm going to give a brief answer because it could be a lot of discussion about recall. It could be another topic for another Helix uh, uh, meeting. Uh, we don't know anything about the mechanisms of recall. It's very difficult to study because it, it's an instantaneous. It, it's, it's, a, it's a moment that happens. And studying the biology of that is, is, is going to be the next frontier, I'm sure. Uh, but it, it has not been as easy to approach as encoding in new memories and long-term memory uh, consolidation and storage information. So recall is a major, major question. Uh, I would not equate this with LTP. First, uh, long-term potentiation is uh, the equivalent, is believed or is suggested to be the equivalent of long-term memory, long-term potentiation. Uh, or memories formation, let's say, but not recall. Uh, there are studies, of course, that can reactivate the, the electrophysiological measurements. But again, um, relating that to recall of memories is a big jump, as you can imagine. You know, one electrophysiological measurement is a monodimensional understanding compared to the complexity of the brain. So. Oh no! I apologize. When I when I was referring to LTP, I was mostly not in terms of recall, but it's as you talked about. It's what I to me creates the network and the system from which the memory sort of first builds upon through synaptic pruning and what have you. And obviously LTD, a long term depression, the and the cerebellum. But yeah, that's that's a whole other discussion for another day. Um, and then um, I get. Okay, this is a good this is a good light one, I think, because um, and it's a good one to end it off. This person, it was uh, Trudy Levine asked, how is it when you do a cross puzzle, if you leave it and come back, you'll then remember the, the words that you couldn't remember before, but it comes like this without thinking about it? The computer warming up. It goes somewhere into the default, default network, but it's your brain's processing it even if you're not paying conscious attention. Mm -hmm. It's like coming up with an answer to a problem that you had at night. You wake up and you know the answer in the morning. And I think it's the same sort of thing. And not so much a memory issue, I would think, but it relates also to um, getting offline 
not having your brain occupied with something else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that it has an opportunity to sort of reconfigure itself and perhaps come out with an answer. Of course, it doesn't always work, but there is this idea that either sleeping on it or taking a break and doing something else can improve uh, performance. Well, I'd like to thank everyone so much for your wonderful contributions. There's so much that hasn't been said, but I think we've all learned. We've all, I hope, recorded. And I hope many of us will remember much of what was said, but it was all terribly important. And I thank you so much <laughs> for participating. And thank you, Beverly, for organizing it and moderating. Yes, and I thank wish you, you all very well, very well as we proceed to manage. Next year in person. Thank you. So goodbye, yep. everyone who's come. Thanks. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.